I asked Jim if I could give an introduction for him because he will never remotely do a good job of introducing himself. <laughs> um, 20 years ago, Jim started working on the software that became Zoom. I'll tell a funny story about that during the lunch. Uh, but it's amazing to go back and think about that. We had marketing brochures at the time, three big points. One of them was a database that feels like a file system. Still true today, still very different from everybody else in the market, still feels revolutionary. URLs you can read to your grandmother over the phone. Back then it was vignette and this was your URL. Object publishing, still revolutionary today. And don't let your customers shoot you in the foot, which was hierarchical security and hierarchical audits. It's amazing to think about what Zope and after that flown, based on these ideas, have done hundreds of companies around the world bet their business on Zoop back in the day. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies built their businesses on top of flown, based on ideas that still haven't been caught up to. Uh, Philip Eby one time wrote a forward to a book, forward to a book about Zoop and about Python, saying the rest of Python doesn't even know what they don't know when they talk about Zoop and talk about flown. So, um, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to make fun of Jim. Um, tonight, if you buy me a beer, I'll tell you the story about what Jim said when the venture capitalist said that everyone should work 70 hours a week. So instead, I'll tell you a different story, because he's talking about the ZODB. Unlike my other stories, this one's true. He walks into my office and my office is approximately the size of this chair. And he sits across the other side, because I've been bugging him, can we have transactions? Can we have persistence? Can we have transactions? Can we have multi-app server processes? And he comes in and he says, what do you think we are, a database company? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the <laughs> I should point out that when I said that, it wasn't in um, anger, it was in joy and expectation. Um, especially object-oriented databases, because back then they were still, they were still a thing. Um, there were companies doing interesting work with object-oriented databases, and I thought it was, I thought it was pretty exciting. It's a, it's, it's a shame that the, I mean, it's understandable, thank you, Java, that, uh, that the industry sort of went a different direction, but um, th there was a lot of, Cool research going on back then. Okay, so uh, I'd like to talk to you. You know, I've been, I've been, as I'll mention, uh, I've been working a lot on ZODB lately. Um, been doing some interesting things, move forward on some things, um, and uh, so I want to, and I, and I plan to continue doing that for a while at least. And um, so I'd like to get uh, input about, you know, directions that we might go. Um, so I really want this talk to be kind of a conversation. Whenever I give a talk, um, I always start by saying, you know, the, the, the only bad question is the one you don't ask, and I prefer to be interrupted rather than have you have a question and then miss out, although this isn't going to be super technical. Um, so, but, but I encourage you to, to ask questions. If it gets out of hand, I'll, we'll, we'll move on. But, um, but uh, there's a lot of time here so that, that we can actually do that. So um, anyway. So I'm working 100% on ZUDB um, and have been for several months. Um, I've wanted to do this for a long time. Um, there were times at Zope Corporation when I was really when I could focus on it, but I was I was really focused on the problems that we were trying to solve, and we solved some pretty interesting problems. Um, and then uh, Zope Corporation is is gone. If you didn't know that, but Zope Zope, Zope Corporation is is. Uh, it's like the Python and in, in, it's like the Parrot and Monty Python. Um, so, um, so I have you know I hadn't been able to work on. It. I was doing interesting work for a great company, but I really wanted to work on on ZODB again, and I really wanted to uh, provide some focus to really give it a chance to uh, to succeed. Um, succeed in the niche that it belongs in because it's not a solution to every problem. Uh, no, no database is really. Uh, it always it always frustrates me when people say, "Well, this is a good database," and th that statement makes no sense 
out of the context of, of whatever problem you want to solve. Um, but I think ZooDB is an excellent database for certain kinds of problems, and I'm, I'm excited to be focusing on it again. This was made possible uh, because ZeroDB, a company called ZeroDB was, uh, was building a product on top of ZeroDB. They took advantage of the fact that most of the logic is on the client, which meant that the data could be encrypted on re at rest on the server, and, and, and that was sort of an opportunity. Um, unfortunately, their customers weren't really Python developers. Uh, they didn't really, you know, it wasn't really a good fit for the kind, for the kind of customers that they had. So uh, we did a lot of interesting work together, but they're, they're focusing on their Hadoop effort, and I'm continuing to focus on ZUDB and hoping that uh, there'll be some opportunities for me to help out on projects, provide training, consulting, et cetera, uh, including I, 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 Zope Corporation used to offer uh, support contracts for both Zope and ZUDB, when more or less whatever you'd want to buy them on. But, uh, but they, were, they were structured in an interesting way because you could buy uh, your, a support contract, basically it gave you a certain number of hours, it didn't give you a solution. And I think that's actually, especially for open source, a pretty good model. Because if you, if you have to give somebody a solution, then you have to limit their freedom to be able to hack on the software. And so, anyway, I, I, I'd like to do that uh, when I figure out how. But moving along, um, so before I get into sort of bringing you up to date on some of the happenings, I'd like to get some, some, some feedback from the audience on a couple of things. So if you're using ZUDB, unless you're, unless you're doing an embedded system, and there have been some interesting embedded systems with ZUDB, and, and, and you know, I, I occasionally hear of interesting things where something like file storage makes a lot of sense. But if you're doing a typical web app or a typical, um, typical database application, you're going to be using ZUDB with uh, rel storage, Neo, or Zio. So, uh, uh, how many, so, so I, I want to get a feeling for what people are using these days. So, so uh, how many people are using Neo? Nobody, I'm not surprised. But uh, does anybody know what Neo is? How many people know what Neo is? Well, that's, that's, that's kind of cool. So Neo has a lot of potential. Uh, uh, Nexity is, is doing projects for people where performance and reliability are, are really important. And so they're doing some interesting things with Neo in terms of, you know, sort of highly durable storage. So um, I think that's a, that's a worthy thing to investigate. Uh, it's a little bit more effort to set up, but uh, I think it's a worthy, worthy alternative. How many people are using RHEL storage? Okay, and how many people are using Zio? Okay, uh, cool. Thank you. Oh, uh, uh, okay, so of those people are using Zio, how many people are using ZRS? Okay, well, I encourage you, if you're using Zio, I encourage you to try ZRS. Um, it provides uh, real-time backup. It's not quite as durable as Neo. With, with Zio, um, typically replication happens very quickly, but theoretically you could have a, a system crash between committing a transaction and before it's gotten replicated to another system. And so there's a little bit of a chance of losing data, whereas with Neo, Neo doesn't commit the transaction, doesn't consider the transaction committed and, until it's been committed on, on, on a majority of the replicas. But, 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 but ZRS works really well and it's, and it's actually, especially since Z, ZRS2, ZRS1 was, it was kind of a nightmare with, I forget what it was using, but it was kind of a mess. But ZR2 is extremely simple. And I'll, I'll say a little, bit, a little bit more about some of the opportunities with ZRS later. But anyway, so I encourage you, if you're using Zio, I encourage you to, to, uh, to use ZRS to back up your data. It's, it, 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 in, my, in my opinion, at Zope Corporation, we never actually did backups. So we never used Repose. We never backed up our databases. We just replicated them. And so we knew that they were essentially backed up, and they were backed up in real time. Uh, yeah, so. Okay, so in terms of providing search in your applications, how many people are using a catalog or something like that? Okay, how many people are using an external index? Okay, fair number. And how many people don't use an index at all? Just maybe use a vtree here and there. Yeah, not, I guess I'm not surprised at that. Um, at Zope Corporation, for what it's worth, we ended up, uh, partly because of the nature of the applications we were doing, so towards the end we were doing some interesting uh, mobile applications. 
where we, it wasn't really content management. And so we actually just, where we needed to search, uh, we, we pretty much just used a few V trees. Um, okay, so uh, I'm probably, I had, I, I, when I was writing this slide, I, f I was afraid that I'd miss some pain point because I feel no pain. But, uh, but uh, how many people feel that database performance is a pain point for them? Hmm. Okay, interesting. Uh, conflicts. Okay, probably a lot of the same people. Uh, indexing. Wow, you, you all are very kind. Either that or I've forgotten all the pain points. Uh, rules of persistence or the, the sort of programming model. Okay. Uh, anybody want to shout out any pain points that I've missed? Okay, well, you can tell me later, too. Okay, so uh, I want to say a little bit about some of the stuff that, that ZeroDB, uh, that I did with Zero, ZeroDB. So ZeroDB had two products. One was a, and they're both about storing data encrypted at rest. The, the first was a database built on ZeroDB. Uh, and then the second was uh, something similar with Hadoop, where the idea is that you'd unencrypt your data as it entered a pipeline and encrypt it at the other end. At least I, I assume that's what it was. I never really got into it myself. And that's what they're focusing on now. So uh, one of the first things I did, uh, because I felt it was, you know, the, the, the ZO implementation is very old. It's uh, the, the zero, ZO4 implementation. Um, and it was kind of a little bit over-engineered and kind of compl complex in some places. And the, uh, and the library that it was using, the asynchronous library, Async Core, uh, which is by, it's gotta be by far the oldest async library in Python. Uh, and it's the same library not quite coincidentally, that Z server was built on um, async core uh, is is really sort of deprecated. It has some issues, and there was some suspicion that maybe it was contributing to ZO performance. Um, over the years, when I've talked to people, I've I've heard a lot about performance issues of ZO. Um, there was the whole ZODB shootout thing. I think ZO is a little bit closer to parity now, but um, but that's been something that's bothered me. For for a long time, and there was a suspicion that maybe async core was to blame, and, and maybe it is a little bit. Um, so uh, before doing other things like SSL, and of course async IO also makes SSL easier because it's got support built in. Um, we did, we, I re-implemented on, on async, async IO. That would have been less effort than I put into it, except that I also use that opportunity to clean up the code base quite a bit. Um, and, and so that was, that was a good thing. Um, and in fact, there were some performance improvements, especially for writes. Um, and uh, for, there were a couple of, couple of places. I, I published some performance. I've, I've added a, a link there to, the, to a spreadsheet that has the results and some, just some description of, of how I did them. It also is interesting because it touches on some configuration choices you have, like whether you use SSL or not, or whether you use server sync, which I'll talk about in a minute, or, or, or not. Um, um, but anyways, uh, ZO5 is, is especially, on, uh, especially with 3. Python 3.5 and UV loop, which is an alternate implementation of the async IO event loop. Um, it's Significantly faster for reads if by significant you consider like maybe 20 or 30 percent significant <laughs> for, uh, for writes in most cases, and especially at high uh, concurrency, it's orders of magnitude, it's an order of magnitude faster, so it's quite a bit faster. Um, okay. Now, uh, by, by async IO introduced sort of a flurry of interest in asynchronous programming. In, uh, in Zoop and using ZODB, and um, uh, I'm I'm a I, I'm <laughs> I've used asynchronous uh, libraries for uh, for I/O applications pretty much since I've been using uh, from the beginnings of digital you know since since say '96. Um, so I've I've been a big fan of asynchronous I/O. Uh, I very biased, I, I have pat, happen to hate asynchronous programming interfaces. Uh, and ZODB is an inherently synchronous API. You know, that for better or worse, I think for better, but, but people can legitimately, can legitimately say worse, 
Uh, ZDB is about is an object-oriented database, and it wants to provide the illusion that that you're just working with objects in Python more or less like you work with any other data. Um, so that's what it's really about. That's its that's its value proposition. And so there's really no good way to fit um, an asynchronous programming model into that, at least that I can see. Although there's been some interesting work that I'm going to learn a little bit more about later tonight. So maybe maybe my mind will be changed. Um, so <clears throat> Zio is using an asynchronous library, but that, but it really it, that's only an implementation detail, and in fact that that could change. There's a um, there's an issue w which I mentioned here is that, and and I and I I I I realize this um, when when doing sort of profiling and performance analysis of you know when, when working on Zio five. And Shane actually sort of figured it out a while ago, which is that, although I'm not sure if he figured out in exactly these terms, but when, you, when you're combining an async I.O. library with thread pools, when, when the thread's done doing its work, it has to notify the, the async library that it should, you know, do something with the data. And um, it turns out that, that that interface seems to be expensive uh, relative to, say, a, th a thread queue, or a queue, or a, or a or a lock of some kind, um, and in fact, for Zope and Z Server years ago, Shane introduced this hack into Z Server so that um, rather than waking up the event loop, he just when when a request is done, he just writes directly to the output socket, and there's a lock that protects that so that the event loop and the and the and the, and, the, and the thread pool don't write to it at the same time. And that's a bit, that turns out to be a big performance win. So there is, a, there is a little bit of a dark side to the architecture that I recommend in terms of async server and thread pools. But this also has an impact on Zio. So uh, I might actually, in the future, go to a, actually a less asynchronous model in the implementation of Zio because of that. So this, this led me into, I, I didn't really have any good place to put these slides, and I'm disturbing the, the flow a little bit, but there's some, there's some things I wanted to point out relative to this. Uh, and in terms of just when thinking about developing with ZODB, you know, if you're, if, you're developing with, if you're developing an application that only has, you know, one client, some of these things aren't important. But if you're, if, if you're anticipating an application that has lots and lots of clients, then some of these things become very important. So the first is that, um, when, when trying to service lots of clients, you want to keep transactions very short. And, and, and there are a few reasons for this. One is the shorter the transaction, or long transactions have a much higher chance of a conflict. Because basically, when a transaction, ZDB uses a, uh, a timestamp-based time uh, protocol, which many modern databases use, where basically you, at the start of a transaction, it sees a snapshot of the database as of the start of the transaction. And so any changes made after that potentially conflict. So you wanna, you wanna reduce that window. Um, also connections are expensive resources. One of, the, one of the big wins of ZUDB is its object caching. Please don't call this a pickle cache. There's a module that suggests you should call it a pickle cache. It's an object cache. It doesn't cache pickles, it caches objects. Uh, but anyway, so, so th there's this object cache, and you want it to be big enough to hold your working set, in, ideally. But that means it's in a very expensive resource because, because um, you can, you know, because you don't want to have a lot of connections unless you have a lot of memory, uh, because connections can can use up a lot of memory if your working set is of any significant size. Uh, and if you've got any long-running <coughs> tasks that you need to do, consider trying to do them asynchronously, typically using some sort of queuing system like Celery or SQS or, or what have you. But unfortunately, there's a gotcha with that in that you want, you want to find some way to, uh, to ha do that handoff reliably. And, uh, and, and, and most of the solutions, like, like Celery doesn't really provide a good way to do that. Uh, SQS doesn't provide a good way to do that. So. Um, we came up with something at Zope Corporation that, imbued, that used a very short-term transactional queue, and then and then we would move data from the transactional queue into, like in our case, SQS. Um, and so, it would be ideal if you could somehow hand off to something like Celery transactionally, so that if the if the transaction committed, you knew that Celery had it. But 
with, with us, we were, we were sending data at SQS, and it hardly ever failed, like, like really, 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 really rarely failed. But any failure is really hard to reason about. <laughs> so we really didn't want to tolerate any failure because we didn't know what the heck was going to happen if it failed. So anyway. Um, also, something in terms of, again, this is a little bit off, off the, the, the path I was going, but these are some ideas that I wanted to, to share. Um, if, you have a, if you're building a large application on top of ZODB, or possibly any database that, that has an effective cache, um, a common problem is that your working set doesn't fit in memory. I, I, I've talked to people who said, well, I've got, you know, I've got something that, hold, you know, that, that runs a whole bunch of sites within a given instance. So this is not an uncommon problem. It, at Zope Corporation, we had a, <clears throat> one application that hosted uh, 400 newspaper sites. And the, the, the data that we typically needed to use wasn't, you know, was, was too large to really fit in the amount of RAM that we, that we had available to us. We used, we allocated at roughly four gigs, really three gigs per, per process. Um, and so because of that, um, we were constantly, you know, churning data in and then having to make requests to the server. And then the server was getting beat up pretty bad because we were constantly hitting it. So uh, we wrote, we wrote a content aware load balancer so that, and, and the one that we wrote happened to be dynamic so that it would sort of learn and, and sort things out over time. But there are a number of content, content aware load balancers available. And with the content aware load balancer, you could sort of say, okay, well, <clears throat> if there's any correlation between the content that you need and something in the request, then you can say, okay, all of the, all of the requests of this particular class that need this particular content, I'm gonna send over here and then all these, all, you know, and then in, so you could segregate by class, and then reduce the uh, reduce the, essentially split up the uh, the working set, and that was a huge win for us. We were, and also just just to give you an idea of you know scale feasible with ZODB, we were we were running forty or fifty clients, and then after adding the content aware load balancer, we were able to reduce that to about twenty clients, and also when we had to restart a client, it started a lot quicker. Um, just generally things moved a lot better. So if you've got, you know, sort of large applications where the sort of content can be segregated, you should consider that. Um, so when I think about growing ZODB, among the things I think about are maybe moving beyond Python. And the, 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 the thing that's most interesting is, from a market point of view, is JavaScript. Uh, but again, remember I said earlier that, that ZODB is inherently a synchronous API, and that, of course, is at odds with JavaScript. So for what it's worth, uh, if I were to do this, and I would love to do this, I wouldn't do it speculatively, but if somebody wanted to pay me to do it, I'd love to work on it. Uh, but uh, if I were to do something like this, uh, I would probably run ZUDB client-side applications in web workers, uh, and then have them provide an asynchronous API to the UI. So that your browser UI would still use an asynchronous interface, but it would be an application level interface rather than a, than a low level ZODB interface. And if I were to do this, I would actually rewrite it in JavaScript. It's, ZODB actually isn't that big, if you're, if you're familiar with it. And after working on it a few months, I'm pretty familiar with it. <laughs> uh, I'll probably forget it if I stop, but right now I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, so anyway. Uh, if you're interested in this whole issue of like asynchronous APIs and performance, there was a really interesting article that was posted last year where somebody actually, you know, measured the blockiness of different database APIs on the client. And they found that local storage, which is synchronous, was less blocky than IndexedDB. Um, so, yeah. No silver bullets, I'm afraid. Uh, okay, so. Back to new new things in ZODB that are a lot of these are interesting from a performance point of view, and most of you said you weren't interested in performance, so sorry. Uh, but um, but uh, a challenge for some applications is if the if is is that that when an application, especially an application startup, but even in other situations, uh, you need to make a bunch of requests, and uh, in ZO4. Only one request could be outstanding at a time, and there was there was no real way to say I want these five objects. Uh, and uh, so my first answer to that really is, 
at, at least for the startup problem, is use a persistent cache. Uh, persistent cache has got a bad name because for a while they were kind of unstable, but uh, we finally solved those problems several years ago, but I don't think the word has gotten out. There can be also some operational challenges with them, but, but if, this is a, if this is something of concern to you, if you have a working set that could fit in a Zeo cache, <coughs> uh, you know, persistent caches are stable at this point. So. But, so, but, but, but you might have a situation where, for example, you have a bunch of objects that, you know, may, maybe you did a, uh, some sort of index query and you have a bunch of objects that you know you're gonna wanna load because you're a genius. Uh, and uh, so there's now an API that lets you do that. And so the way it works is you, you call prefetch and you can pass OIDs or objects or, lists, or sequences of OIDs or, sequence, or actually iterables of OIDs or as I like to say it, iterables of objects. Um, <clears throat> and what it does is it sends the request to the server but it returns right away. And so when you go to fetch one of the objects, um, Zio will say, oh, okay, well, I'm already fetching this object, so I won't make a new request. I'll just wait till that request I made before comes back. And then by the time you get the first object, chances are the next object is gonna be right behind it. Um, so so it basically, it basically uh, addresses the sort of round trip latency of requesting objects one at, one, one at a time. The challenge is, is figuring out how to actually leverage it. Uh, among, amongst the ideas I thought of is, you know, you load a B tree bucket that contains persistent objects. Maybe you have some policy that you're going to load all those objects in that bucket, but not obviously the whole B tree. Or, or, um, or uh, sometimes you might have an object that has a sub object that's persistent, but you always, gonna, whenever you use the parent, you're always going to use the child. So maybe you want to say, okay, when, when I load these kinds of objects, I'm gonna load the children. Or maybe, looking at it the other way, maybe you have certain kinds of objects that should always be loaded when, they're, when, they're, when they're containing, the referencing object is loaded. So we could build some of that, possibly as pluggable policies into ZODB to actually automate some of those things. Uh, that, that sort of pattern is where, uh, you know, where, where I thought, kind of think of them as sub-objects. Um, so anyway, something to think about. You all have been very quiet. Okay, good. I don't believe it, but good. Okay, so uh, so one of the big things was SSL. Obviously, this was a big thing for zero dB. Um, so it provides encryption of the connection, of course, but it also provides alternate authentication models. And and Zio had an authentication model. It 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 complicated the code quite a bit. It was kind of a specialized thing and it didn't actually encrypt the channel, so I think SSL is a much cleaner option. So the old, old thing is gone. That, that sort of disappeared in part of it. It's part of it. Uh, was, anybody, was anybody using the old uh, Zio authentication mechanism? Whew, good, okay. So I, you know, I think this is kind of interesting. It, it, it provides, uh, like, like zero, db, zero DB was considering, uh, you know, doing like hosted zero DB databases where you know, the, the actual clients are outside their controlled clusters, and so this is, you know, pretty interesting for that. And so, uh, you can basically, when you set up a Zio server, you can give it a collection of self-signed certs that it will then use to authenticate the clients. Um, primarily to allow access to the Zio, Zio server itself, but you could, you could do, you could obviously do more than that, and they did, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a second, but, um, Anyway, amongst the things you could do is, and that they did was, they played with the model where each each user would upload a, a certificate of their own and then use that to authenticate. And then they later came to, a, I think, a, a saner approach of just simply using usernames and passwords, but that were sent over the SSL connection. Um, another interesting change is that, um, Zio now supports client-side conflict resolution. Uh, Neo and, and uh, RHEL storage already did this. Um, for zero DB, since, they, since the data were encrypted on the server, there was no real way, and, and the server didn't have the keys to unlock it by design, the server couldn't do conflict resolution. So in order to be able to do conflict resolution, and for some applications that's important, 
then, um, then, then we needed to move it to the client. And this has been something that I've been wanting to do for a while. In fact, I'd like to take it a step further. Um, well, let me, let me, I'll come back to that. So with, with conflict resolution on the client, there's, there's potential to do a lot more. Um, for example, you could have conflict resolution object that looked at logic that looked at more than one object at a time. The current machinery also really only sees state. It doesn't really, it, 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 and it tries to deal with common situations where it doesn't have the classes around. So for example, if you've got a B tree that contains references to persistent objects, it doesn't know what the persistent objects are, but it knows what their IDs are. And so it takes that into account in terms of deciding what's a conflict and what's not a conflict. But if you did this on the client, of course, everything is there. You also have like operational advantages, but but the, the, big, the, the big potential win here is to actually possibly get to the point where common situations are, are sort of, can always be resolved. So, you know, what I'd like is to have sort of non-conflicting data structures, which, but, which is really a misnomer. What I mean is data structures where we can always resolve the conflicts. Um, um, and I think, that's, I think that's within reach if we do it on the client. What I'd like to do eventually is actually move conflict resolution up to the ZODB uh, and then sort of start exploring some of the different ways that we might make con conflict resolution always work for some interesting cases. Like the, the one that comes to mind the most to me is, is implementing a queue. And you know, you should be able to implement a queue in such a way that it doesn't conflict. But you know, the, a lot of the common use cases, like you know, adding separate, you know, adding or updating separate keys in a in a B tree, you know, we, we could probably arrange that that never conflicts. Right now, those conflict <coughs> when uh, when a B tree when a B tree bucket splits, and so there and then you get into all these strategies to try to prevent that from happening, and and, and it's kind of a <coughs> it, it kind of ends up sort of going in a lot of different places. Like, oh, are the beach, are the buckets big enough? How do you allocate the keys? If you allocate keys sequentially, then you're going to be, you know, th then lots of different threads are going to conflict at the same time whenever, when it splits. So um, anyway, so getting back to, to the client side uh, conflict resolution, of course, it, it works with encrypted data. Uh, the biggest operational win is that you no longer need custom classes on the server. So if you've tried to write your own classes that implement conflict resolution, um, then in order for them to work, they have to be on the server, uh, which, is a, which is a deployment headache. Now you can't simply use a, a generic ZO, or in our case, ZRS, RPM, or Docker image, or what have you. You've got to have these other classes. But if you do the, do the conflict resolution on the client, then, then this is not an issue. Also, it, it potentially reduces server load because the server's not doing this computation of the conflict resolution. And it opens the door for non-Python servers. The, con the cons are that you increase the number of round trips to the server when there's a conflict. The way, it, basically, the way it works is that when, when, uh, when at the during the, the the at the transition from the first phase of conflict resolution to the second, there's a, a, a vote step, and uh, so so before a vote was you know always return yay or nay, but now it returns a uh, it can still return yay or nay, but it also can return a, a a list of conflicts. And then the client, if it can resolve all the conflicts, it rewrites them to the server. And then if there are no conflicts at that point, then it can commit. And uh, the client side conflict resolution doesn't support uh, undo. So undo uh, can possibly sometimes undo transactions that would otherwise not be undoable by using conflict resolution. So um, another feature that was added that, that I worked on uh, for ZeroDB, it didn't turn out well, but uh, is object level locks. So currently, when Zio locks a when, when Zio um, when Zio locks a database for the second phase of conflict resolution, it locks the entire database. Now I, I think there's a I think some people have a misconception that it it locks during the entire um, con uh, commit process, but it only it only emits it only gets the database wide lock in the second phase. Um, 
And that's a problem because in the second phase, there's a round trip to a client. And sometimes clients aren't, well, I mean, round trips are expensive to begin with. And sometimes you can have misbehaving clients, possibly because they're talking to another transaction manager that don't re respond in a timely way. And, and you're, you're basically prevented from committing new data while that's going on. So it's, it's kind of a problem. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, a, a way to mitigate that is to get object level locks so that if, you know, so if you lock a transaction that, that touches certain, that modifies a certain set of objects, transactions that don't touch those objects can still commit. And in fact, this is what NEO does. So another, another, another reason to investigate NEO. I should have investigated NEO more myself, but I'm really lazy. And uh, it's a little bit involved to set up, so I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so uh, I did some work on, on object level locks for Zio, and I got it working. Uh, but it didn't actually provide a performance win, uh, except when clients were connected over very slow links, which I think was potentially a useful use case for zero DB, since that, that, that was one of the things they wanted to be able to have uh, outside clients be able to talk to the database. But, um, but for a, sort of a normal configuration, it really didn't provide a win. In fact, it might have even been slower. Um, and I think a big part of the problem is it's really easy to get under heavy load, like, like we do in a benchmark. But at Zope Corporation, we definitely, especially before we did the content-aware load balancer, um, we, we beat up our servers pretty bad. And, and um, Zio4 uses multiple threads. And so you could actually, I, I mean, I've seen, the Zio, our, I've seen our Zio servers go to 200% CPU, which means they're actually using more than one CPU. Mainly, that's because they're they're doing I/O outside the jail, you know, outside the. They're, a lot of a lot of the, a lot of the computation is not done in Python; it's done in C because you're you know doing I/O and C. Um, but so it's not it's not uncommon to 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 get the Zio server CPU bam. And so even though theoretically there should have been a win by letting multiple transactions happen in parallel. Uh, the win was sort of swamped by the, the database being just slow. Part of that was that there was extra computation involved in actually managing the locks, but I don't think it was that significant. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and uh, well, Jason Madden has, and... Uh, Jason Madden is awesome. He's, he does a lot of interesting things with ZODB, and he kind of pushes it to limits. He runs ZODB, by the way, for people interested in async. Uh, he uses a G event for all of his servers. It's still a threaded computing model, but it's, it's on an async library. Um, but anyway, he did some analysis, and it was, it, was, it was quite a bit faster using PyPy, especially on the server, not so much on the client, but on the server, it was a pretty significant win. So, you know, that's definitely something to consider if you're deploying Zio servers. Uh, if I was deploying Zio servers today, I would, I would definitely consider that. So some other interesting things about, um, so, so, so up to now I've been mostly talking about the improvements to ZioDB that I did on, on behalf of ZeroDB. But they did some interesting experiments. They actually did most of these experiments before I got involved, and I just sort of enhanced them a bit. But um, because they were sort of thinking about um, of trying to provide hosted zero DB, uh, they came up with a model for multi-tenant databases. And so what, what, what that really meant was that somebody could walk up to uh, a UI theoretically and say, I want to buy a database. And what, what they would really get is a is a is a sub-database of an existing database. And so they had a mechanism for uh, splitting databases, a single database into virtual databases where each database was owned by a user. Um, each user's records were encrypted separately. So even if the users saw each other's records, they wouldn't be able to decrypt them. Plus they had an access control model that, um, that prevented access to other users' data. And uh, also interestingly, that affected invalidation. So, so invalidations for a user would only be sent to that user. They wouldn't be sent to other users. And of course, they had a, a user database and an authentication model. 
Um, so it was pretty interesting. I think it's worth, particularly if you want to sort of support multiple, if you have a need to support multiple databases within a Zeo server, uh, I think this is a potentially good way to go about it. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I actually spent a little bit of time in the spring looking harder at Neo, um, and uh, and then as as part of that, I realized that based on some, I mean, Neo has done a lot of interesting things where they patch the ODB to work a little bit differently and and, and actually a little bit better, um, and so I got to, I mean, I. I'm sure they've t given me those patches before, but you know, at some time when I was fighting some other fire and I never really bothered with them, and it's a shame because there are some pretty good patches. And so most, if not all, of those patches got applied, and one of them really simplified quite a bit the way ZODB implemented multi-version concurrency control, uh, which both simplified the logic quite a bit, and then also sort of at the same time and as part of the same cleanup uh, allowed me to reduce some get rid of some stupid sort of cases of locking things and preventing concurrency when it wasn't really necessary. Um, and as sort of part of this, and, and part of sort of making sure rel storage would work with this new way of doing things, I realized that actually the way we were moving and the way Z Neo was doing things was already in some ways closer to the way rel storage worked. Um, and in the course of this, I also realized something that I never understood before in terms of rel storage is that, because it was always kind of weird because rel storage had this, this IO called MVCC storage. And I was like, wait, wait, ZODB is already MVCC. What? Why are we doing this? And the key is that rel storage uses the MVC implement, MVCC implementation of the underlying database. And so it, it leans on the underlying database to do that. And that's why, and so really most of what it's doing is just sort of bypassing ZODB's MVCC. So the end result of all of this is that the rel storage API is now the dominant API, and the older storages like Zeo and Neo and Cloud Storage, et cetera, are really adapted to the, the API that, that rel storage provides. Um, and uh, and the, the adapter is where the MVCC logic is. It's actually changed the storage API a bit. The, the, for those people who have ever dealt with it, which you probably haven't unless you're a, a, a ZDB hacker, is that the load method, which is sort of like a core method, is now gone, or, or effectively gone, and, and now everything uses load before. Another happy sort of outcome of all of this discussion is that uh, Shane Hathaway has handed the baton for, uh, well, he sort of dropped the baton a couple years ago, but he picked it up and he handed it to Jason Madden. And so now RHEL Storage has a maintainer, which is a really good thing. So um, a common problem, and this was brought up on the list a few months ago, is sort of uh, inconsistency between Zeo clients. And, and a typical scenario, one that we ran into at Zope quite a bit, was you'd have a request that caused an object to be added, and then the browser on the next request um, would, would then try to do something with that object, and they would happen to hit a, another Zeo client very quickly, and that Zeo client hadn't gotten the news of the new object. Uh, and the reason this happens is that each client is, is consistent, but it's consist, consistent as of a particular point in time. And because network, network uh, communication isn't instantaneous, while all clients are consistent, they may not be consistent with each other in terms of what, what sort of view of time they have. Um, and this, uh, this, this potentially, this, this was a problem for Zeo. It could potentially have been a problem with rel storage as well due to the, uh, the, the way it polled. Uh, if, you, if, you didn't, if you set the poll interval to zero, I think it polled at the beginning of every transaction, I think. Um, but if you send it to non-zero, then potentially you could have the same problem. So uh, Neo, well, it's okay. So Neo has always, at the beginning of a transaction, uh, made a round trip to the server, and it didn't really matter what that round trip did. It could have could have effectively been a ping, 
but what that does is by waiting for that round trip, any, any invalidations that were in flight, it sees before it gets the answer to its ping. And so that means it may be at a different time as the, as the client that added the data, but it's at least as up to the, up, up to the time at which that object was added. Um, so Neo has always done this. Zio now has an option to do it. And rel storage has gotten rid of the, uh, the poll interval. And so now it effectively makes this round trip every time as well. Uh, the reason it's an option in Zio is that it's kind of expensive in the sense that you're making a round trip. If all your data are in memory, you're making, you know, you, you've changed what, what would, would have made no server round trips to something that's making a server round trip. So if this is a problem for your applications, this is an easy way to solve it. But if it's not a problem for your applications, then, then I would consider not, not doing it. Maybe it should be the default and, and maybe turning it off should, should be the option. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you could always conceivably, um, it, should be, it should be doable on, I mean, there, there are a bunch of application strategies that you can do, use for this, but it's kind of a bother. <laughs> it's potentially a win because it would mean that you, you wouldn't need to sync unless you knew that you needed to sync. So it's potentially a performance win. But this, this actually provides an easy way to say, okay, I'm gonna just make the problem go away. So what have I, so ZeroDB sort of start when it started going in a different direction in, uh, or decided to go into, into a different direction at the end of the summer. So what have I been doing since then? Well, um, uh, I decided after, after a while that I just absolutely had to unscrew the documentation situation. Um, it's been, it's been a sore for a long time. I, you know, I've, I'm a bad person. I didn't really pay. I didn't make it a priority a long time ago. Um, but for Z, Z, for Z, ZODB to succeed, it's got to have decent documentation. Um, so um, the documentation is at when you go to zodb.org, you have a, a sort of why use ZODB statement, and then links off to both uh, non-reference and reference documentation. Uh, it's far more extensive than everything we had before. It could be improved a lot. And you can help me improve it by bitching at me about things that really should be documented. Um, you can help me even more by writing documentation, of course. But I don't mind writing documentation if, if, if you help me by telling me what, I, what you think needs to be explained better or needs to be explained more. Uh, I don't think I don't think this documentation would ever necessarily be a replacement for, say, something like the ZADB book, but but um, it should be fairly complete and, and give concise documentation of pretty much everything people need to know, and including touching on topics like how do you do more scalable ZADB applications. So there's more work that needs to be done, but I feel like I actually got it to a point where we could finally retire that that guide that had been written 20 years ago. Uh, and was woefully out of date and written as a blog post. And, um, I, and, the, and the documentation is executable thanks, thanks to Manuel. Manuel, so uh, Manuel, how many people know about Manuel? Manuel, actually, actually it's Manuel. It's a very cool tool. If you, if you write documentation for like software libraries, it makes it really easy. So, so when we did, do, when, we, when, when I fell in love with doc tests, um, I really like the idea of executable documentation, but what I learned way too late, just look at the build.docs, um, is, is that tests don't make good documentation. But good documentation can help with the tests. And so uh, what I did for uh, Bobo, Bobo, uh, 
NGI and, uh, and the ZADV docs is I wrote documentation and then I made sure that all the examples were executable. Uh, so, um, so, so a couple of infrastructure projects that I've been thinking about for a while in terms of, again, performance and, you know, so I've operated big ZODB databases for, for multiple Zope Corp customers for several years. And uh, in addition to, in addition to uh, the overall performance, packing was, a, was, a, was kind of a big deal. Um, so, um, file storage, first of all, the, the implementation hasn't changed in, again, probably close to 20 years. Um, and it, you know, it works, but it's, it's pretty slow. And, uh, and of course, it, it, it's particularly problematic because of the gill, because while you're packing, then you're, you're sort of starving other things, even though it runs in a separate thread. So one of the first things I did was ZC file storage, which does most of the packing off in a separate process. It actually creates a sub-process to, to, to do most of the work. Uh, and I also wrote uh, ZC, ZADB, DGC, which, uh, which was primarily to deal with the problem of, of, of garbage collecting multi-databases. But it turns out that Garbage collecting as a separate process from packing actually is also a big win because you can do it in a separate process and you can do it at your leisure and I think it's a much better model. And so ZC file storage actually doesn't even support garbage collection. But even with all of that, and, and all of that could use a lot of polishing up, uh, a big problem was, was that when you pack a database at the end of the pack process, you're copying data packing, packed records at the same time you're committing. And there's a lot of contention there at the end. And so we got pretty good at Zope Corporation about having lots of metrics. And you could always see a pack because all the metrics would go awful uh, you know, at the last, you know, depending on the database, you know, 10, 20 minutes of a pack. And so we always tried to time things that that happened in the middle of the night. But uh, it was pretty bloody. It was pretty awful. Uh, so file storage is, is design, file storage two is designed largely to solve that problem. Um, it learned some lessons from file storage. I, when I wrote file storage, I never imagined that it would work as well as it does. Um, it's pretty efficient. It's kind to SSDs. Um, it's you know it's a pretty simple model. Um, but um, so anyway, so you know, I, it, it sort of file storage to sort of still keeps the file storage model, but it removes some cruft like back pointers and versions. Uh, back pointers, you can argue whether they're act, actual cruft, but since people hardly ever use, so I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. A question. Um, so uh, today, primarily for undo, when you undo transactions. It doesn't actually write any new data. It just it writes um, it writes back pointers to the data. So it doesn't actually copy the data record. It just says, okay, the data record is back here, which is elegant. And it was actually a big part of the version feature, um, so that when you committed a version, it would do a similar sort of trick. But it adds a lot of complexity to the implement implementation. And since people don't really use undo that much anymore, I don't think uh, it wasn't really worth it, worth keeping it. So it uses multiple files, and the idea is that uh, you have an active file and then some previous files, you know, zero or more previous files. And when you want to pack, the first thing you do is you split and you create a new active file, and that's a very cheap operation. And then at your leisure, you can pack the previous files, and that doesn't that doesn't affect you know the the act you know. And, and when you when you create a previous file. It also writes the index in a way that it can be used as a memory mapped file. So it still uses memory, but it uses memory a little bit more efficiently for the, for the, for the old indexes. Um, but more importantly, you can, uh, if you've got a Jill to deal with, you could, you could pack the, the previous files in a separate process. And then again, at the end of that, there's just a fairly, fairly inexpensive handoff to get the database to use the, their, the index of the new files the indexes of the new files instead of the indexes it was using before. Um, so that's, that's, that's really the big win. Um, so, 
I mean, I, I think from an operational point of view, that would, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't document packing as part of the documentation, partly because nothing else was documenting it, and also because it made me cry. So, um, so the other thing I've been wanting to explore is, could I get the Zeo server to be a lot faster if I didn't write it in Python? And I've been dating different languages over the last few years, looking for, you know, um, a possible choice. Uh, I did, uh, I did a, uh, um, uh, there's, if, you, if you're running in AWS and if you use a lot of blobs, um, uh, you can save money by putting those blobs in S3. And so I wrote a, essentially a, a sort of an S3 blob cache. Uh, and I wrote that in Scala. Scala Scala's a really a lot of fun. I enjoy it quite a bit, but it wasn't very fast. It was probably my fault, but it 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 failed failed the test for for this. So I decided this go around to use Rust. Um, Rust is interesting in a number of ways. It's very fast. I, I mainly started looking looking at it because a friend of mine suggested it, and because I found some things that suggested that it was faster than Go. And the reason I think it's faster than Go is because um, it has no runtime, and in, instead of using a garbage collector, it uses uh, stack-based memory management. So basically, the, the, the sort of standard way of doing things in Rust is everything is either on a stack, or if it's in the heap, then there's a sort of a pointer to, to, to the heap from something that's on the stack. So data is garbage when it goes out of scope. And, and so basically, the memory management decisions are all made at compile time, which is pretty intriguing. Uh, and, and you, you know, could provide some performance wins. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. You can you end up using some reference counting, but it's but you know it's a relatively small subset of your data that's reference counting, and of course it has no 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 gil. Uh, so I started working on this a few weeks ago. Um, some people saw a blog post that I posted a, a while ago. That was about when I decided to start working on it. Uh, it includes a file storage to implementation. Uh, it's very sort of early in development now. I, I've been trying to get it just to the point where I could run benchmarks. Um, so lots of things aren't implemented yet. Um, the internal API is very different than the way it is in Zio. There's no sort of, you know, the, the sort of pluggable storage API isn't really a thing here. Um, it implements object level locks. And it should be as easy to set up as, as Zio or ZRS. Um, Probably easier. I imagine that that replication will just be built in. Um, I, I'm very happy with so ZRS is pretty cool because um, you know in ZUDB if you uh, it has this sort of pluggable storage architecture and we've gotten used to this pattern of just layering things, which I think has worked really well. And ZRS is just another layer, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so you can run you can run a repl you know you can you can run ZRS replication without running a Zio server. It's just it's just another storage, um, but here here nothing is pluggable. Everything is about trying to go as fast as possible, um, and so I expect ZRS to just be built in. Um, so uh, I've been scrambling to try to get to the point where I could do some performance testing before this talk, <laughs> and uh, I I finally got everything running for the for the benchmark um, this morning. Uh, and uh, the initial results on my Mac, it's a four-core Mac, so it's not a terrible machine for initial tests, are pretty encouraging. It's, it's probably, certainly it's twice as fast as, as EO for writes, uh, not quite twice, it's maybe 50% faster for reads, um, but I think, I think I can take it a lot further, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful there. Uh, lots of work remaining, um, including in some Python work. Uh, I, th this whole issue of of uh, waking up uh, event an event loop, um, uh, I think, is 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 a significant performance hit, and it's been part of the Zio design for like ever. So it's kind of embarrassing, but um, I think if I address that, I can actually make Zio go go quite a bit faster just in Python. I uh, have some tests, but I'll need a lot more, uh, and lots of lots of lots of features aren't implemented yet. So, um, 
some uh, things, and on an earlier slide that I, that I skipped past, I, I threatened once again to implement a transaction run decorator for running transactions with, with retries, and I threatened it in anger a couple weeks ago, and I still haven't done it, so that's gonna be one of the next things. But, um, so Z, things, things that I think I would be, from my point of view of, of, of pain points that I felt, and performance has definitely been, you know, since I've worked on, on fairly large projects, things that matter to me, tend a lot of them are about performance. So uh, things that I want from ZADB is more speed. I, I want, I don't want people to choose ZADB because it's fast. It's never gonna be a NoSQL database, believe it or not. Uh, but, uh, but I would like speed not to be a disqualifier for at least for many kinds of applications. Uh, more documentation. Uh, I think object-oriented conflict resolution would be interesting. Uh, if we could get to a point where for a, f a few critical data structures, conflicts could always be resolved, I think that would be a big thing. Um, a really tiny feature, tiny, 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 that would be a big win for certain kind of applications is the ability to subscribe to, to object updates. Uh, this would be interesting for GUI applications. Um, I've got a, an application that I should be finishing, but I'm not, um, for, a, for it's, it's called a two-tier Kanban board. Um, and this board basically, uh, whenever, you know, it, it, it's meant to be like a Kanban board that multiple people use, and whenever somebody makes a change, everybody's view gets updated automatically using um, long polling, because I, WebSock has burned me in the past. I've heard they've gotten better. Um, but, but in order to do that, then, you know, something needs to know that, okay, there have been changes. And so it's an easy, quick hack to hack the DB class to do that, but that should really be a built-in feature. That would really be beneficial and open up some interesting possibilities. As an aside, uh, at Zope Corporation, we, towards the end, <laughs> we, we, uh, we really achieved quite a lot in terms of automation. Uh, and it, it, you know, I, they say that really lazy people are good at automating things, and I'm really lazy, so, uh, um, but we leverage Zookeeper pretty heavily, and Zookeeper, Zookeeper's pretty cool, and there are other similar sorts of tools like etcd, because you can sort of, the idea is it provides a service registry and it, it's a service registry where it not only knows when services appear, but it also knows when they disappear. And so you could sort of get notifications that, oh, this server fell, service fell over, I need to adjust my load balancer, or I need to start a new one, or what have you. And so this idea of, of being notified of things is pretty important. And, and conceivably, if ZADB had this, you know, it might have been an alternative to Zookeeper that might be a lot easier to operate. Because Zookeeper was a little bit of a pain to keep running at times. Uh, let's see, so uh, another, another project that I think would be really interesting for somebody to do, and, and I feel like maybe at some point I should at least enable this um, a little bit, but um, we, we often use, in some of our applications, we use Solar as an external index, and keeping Solar up to date was kind of tricky, especially since Solar itself was replicated. Um, and what, what, what we ended up doing was, um, having the update process keep track of what data Solar had seen last, and, and we sort of you know, kept track of like an, like an index number for, for a data set. Uh, and of course, a much more straightforward way to do this would be to leverage uh, ZRS replication. So the way ZRS's replication protocol is extremely simple. It's basically um, a client connects to the Zio, Zio server and says, I've got this TID. <laughs> And the ZS server then says, okay, I'm gonna send you all data after that TID forever until you disconnect. And that's it. And basically it's just sending data that's very similar if you've ever run like, you know, one of the database iterators like the file storage iterator. And so it's a really simple protocol. And so I'd like to see people write applications where instead of replicating to another ZOD, ZODB database, they look at that stream of data and update Solar or Elasticsearch or a relational database. Um, so any kind of situation where either you have an external index that you want to update or maybe an external uh, sort of replica that might be, you know, easier to write reports against, 
this would be a really interesting way to approach it. And so one of the things I'd like to do if I, if I don't have any reason to do this myself uh, would be maybe to at some point write a, uh, a little module that just provides you the iterator that sort of does most of that for you. Um, Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Potentially, yeah. Well, I think it does. Um, I mean, that's what that's how OIDs are dealt with now. Although I'd like to sort of sometimes not do it that way. Uh, and what you're talking about is not so much of a serial as just a sort of way of generating IDs that don't aren't necessarily ascending. Okay. So uh, one of the challenges, one of the challenges, uh, one of the challenges in 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 my evil plan to get ZADB sort of more alive as a project is to get the wider Python community to know about it again. Uh, and one idea I've had at, at my last job, I was I was I did quite a bit with pandas. Um, as an aside, I found myself saying something that I never thought I'd say, which is that I found it much easier to do data manipulation and data data wrangling in PostgreSQL than I did in Python and Pandas. But uh, anyway, I use Pandas quite a bit, and uh, and uh, it would be, in, in, but, but sharing the data sets was kind of awkward within the team, and uh, so I think, I think it'd be really interesting to have um, persistent Pandas data sets. Using built on top of the ZADB blob mechanism, so that would be a fun project that we do, and I might I might do that soonish if somebody doesn't give me better things to do. Um, something that we've talked about for quite a long time is something that I call a JSONic API because I like to make up words. Um, and uh, so the idea is that you you know when, when looking at a database, you should be able to uh, be able to look at it without having any of the classes around. Um, we have, we, we've had several uh, ZADB browsers like that, but um, I think that would be nice to be a more widely available sort of API, both for accessing a database uh, as JSON rather than objects, or when I, when I say JSON, I really mean, you know, dictionaries and lists and tuples. Um, and, uh, and, and having that mechanism be sort of readily available might be interesting, again, if you're sort of, if you're um, listening to a ZRS stream, you know, getting JSON rather than pickles might be very, very much more convenient for some applications. So Carlos, where, where, where's Carlos? Yeah, he's threatened to uh, sprint on this during the sprint. So if anybody, maybe, maybe somebody's interested in, in helping him with that, I'm gonna try to help remotely. Um, so ZRS, ZRS uh, failover is manual right now and I'd like to make it uh, automatic using some sort of leader election uh, protocol. <laughs> um, we were pretty lucky at Zoeb Corporation. We hardly ever needed to fail over. I mean, I think there were only one or two times we had to fail over unexpectedly. Um, but AWS is pretty awesome. They would, they would often tell us in, in advance that a machine was going away so we could plan. But um, and it also seemed, I don't know if anybody else has noticed this, but um, 
you know, we, we made heavy, so at Zope Corporation, when we, when we were thinking about servers, we had sort of, we classified them into precious and despicable. And uh, so the despicable servers were always run in auto-scaling groups, even if there was only one of them, so that if they fell over, they would be replaced. Whereas the precious servers, you know, required a lot more care. Um, but it seemed like the, like, the, like the despicable servers tended to get wiped out a lot more often than the precious ones. And I, I have the suspicion that AWS sort of, that's part of their policy. If it's an auto-scaling group, it's, you know, despicable. Um, uh, Docker images, maybe official Docker images would be good. There, there are actually several Docker images. I looked on the Docker Hub this afternoon and was surprised. Not, I, should, I wasn't actually really surprised. But, uh, you know, there are several uh, Docker images, which is good, although the one that was most popular was the Plone Docker image, which I guess just implied that, that it was Python 2. Unfortunately, because of the, the fact that Zio f currently uses Pickle as its... Um, as its networking, as the basis of its networking protocol, uh, it um, you can't you can't have a, a, a Python two client talking to a, a Python three server or the other way around, which is really unfortunate. The the Byte server uses Message Pack in part to sort of escape pickle, uh, sadly. Um, so a Docker image should really, unfortunately, until that problem solved, probably identify what Python it needs to be used with. Um, I think a Zio authorization model would be really interesting, especially if people ever start maybe using ZODB for you know, non-traditional applications like client-server applications. Um, and, it, and it occurred to me that, that just, just stealing the Unix file system security model, the traditional one, would be pretty easy to implement and could be pretty useful. Persistent classes, I still think, are, you know, with all the trouble that Z classes had, part mostly, I think, because I, 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 le I left them to wither. But um, I think persistent classes are, are potentially pretty interesting if we could figure out how to do them someday. When, you know, at Zobe Corporation, whenever something was, whenever software was in the database, I could deploy it transactionally, which is really, really cool. Other languages, you know, I'd like to increase ZODB's audience. JS, unfortunately, is the most obvious choice, even though it's not very compatible. Ruby would probably be pretty compatible. Um, Scala would be really interesting, just because I really enjoy Scala, and they've got this macro system that would probably allow the sort of automatic persistence thing to happen. And that's it. So you've been pretty quiet. Any, any parting questions? Yep. Right. I think that's a great idea. There. Um, oh, you, oh, you mean the oh, oh, the client cache? Oh, the client cache, right? Um, you know, the funny thing about the client cache is that the better you, the 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 better you configure your systems, the worse it is. Because, um, because both the client cache and the object cache try to use a, uh, uh, what I prefer to call a most recently used model. Uh, and the thing is if the object cache is really successful at keeping the most recently used, the most used objects, then it's hardly ever gonna request any objects from the client cache. And so the client caches don't really have a signal of, of what, what's actually good. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, except that the placebo effect actually works. Um, okay. I would, I would love to do that. I'm a big fan of instrumentation at, at Zob Corporate. I'm really, I'm really proud of a lot of the sort of DevOpsy things we did towards the end at Zope Corporation, and we did a really good job of having lots of metrics and having lots of graphs of metrics. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, that's kind of challenging because it's, 
the tuning is complicated and the, the I, I definitely think it's a good idea. I, I think things like that should be instrumented. I think this, the storage server should be instru instrumented better as well in terms of knowing what kinds of requests you're getting, how many reads. Something we did a lot with all in a very hacky way was you know, getting a better handle on conflicts and why, you know, what, what was conflicting so we could try to figure out why because it's really sadly easy to make a mistake like allocating keys sequentially um, that cause lots of conflicts that you don't expect. Or like, like uh, a common a pattern that we came up with in Zope three that I regret was um, the um, the uh, ID int ID service where you, it it kept a table of object IDs to integers and a table going the other way around, and I forget. Basically, you think you solve the problem in one direction, not realizing that the problem's still there in the other direction, and so you'd still end up getting conflicts due to bucket splits. If we had object-oriented conflict resolution, then we could pro possibly make that whole problem go away. But, yep. Yes. Well, um, it's actually pretty easy to arrange that um, the storage server only accepts certain globals. Well, no, no, actually, okay, if we get away from pickles, then it gets actually harder. Right, right, right. Um, it used to be possible, well, what we used to do was we used to actually, uh, did we do this on the server or on the client? I guess, what, I don't know. It, it should be possible to do some sort of whitelist. Um, well, okay, so on the, on the potential victim clients, it'd be pretty easy to have a whitelist. And we had a, we had a server, a, a storage wrapper that was trivially implemented that provided a, a whitelist. We just, by accident, never open sourced it, and so Corporation is gone, so it's kind of gone, but it would be really easy to implement. It, it was a trivial implementation to do that, and it could just be done as a storage layer. Well, I, I'm sorry, actually, it could be more easily done if we hooked that into the, into the ZADV machinery itself, so if when you created a database, you could provide a whitelist. That might even be a better way to do it, because then it would be part of the regular deserialization mechanism. It, I mean, some things that we've taken for granted in the past get harder when you have parent pointers. So, for example, object export—you know, exporting a part of your object tree—is. I, I can't remember if we solved that in Zoop three. We may have, but we had to really work a lot harder because. Yeah, yeah. Um, something that I've thought about doing over the years, and I've, I've sort of started to implement at various points, was to do reference counting garbage collection in the storage server. Um, which would be a lot, I mean, which you could still do. You could sort of do a lot of garbage collection earlier um, and more easily without having to open up the records. Like, for example, if the, if the data format that we sent to the server had the, the external references outside of the actual data payload, then you could sort of, without looking at the payload, you could still do, garbage, do, do reference counting garbage collection. Or you could do any kind of garbage collection, but you could do reference counting garbage collection sort of in real time. Potentially, yeah. Back there? Right.
Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, I, I wish I could say that I've run its tests and verified that it works with everything else, but I haven't. Probably works. Somebody should run its tests. <laughs> Well, transactional undo, undo doesn't have to go away. It's just you would do undo. Because undo is rare, you could just get rid of the optimization and say, when, when I undo records, I just copy the older records forward. History is still there, yeah. Time travel, I'm a huge fan of time travel. I'm especially a huge fan of a certain time travel error. <laughs> Any, anything else? So uh, I would love it if you would chip in, you know, chip in on the ZADB list, which is a Google Groups uh, list with, with, you know, when you, when, you, when you leave this room and you remember your pain points, and, I, and they're ones that I haven't mentioned, I encourage you to, to bring them up. Um, okay, thank you very much.